Hi folks, this video is about Dostoevsky's vision of the human condition. There's ways in which I think there's deep connections between how Dostoevsky thinks about our existential situation and Kierkegaard, as well as between both of them and their precursor, Pascal. So earlier on, I gave you a few passages from Pascal where <clears throat> he was one of the folks who really noticed the fact that we have contradictory impulses in ourselves that draw us in different ways and make us feel like we need something to reconcile our state. Uh, so Pascal talks about how he's both the pride and the refuse of the universe, how humanity is both uh, worm and angelic-like, uh, how we can bring these different extremes together at the exact same time. We can be both angel and brute, and the trick to understanding or getting the human condition right, living authentically, is not to eradicate either one of them, but to figure out how to successfully reconcile them. Kierkegaard's view, I think, is incredibly similar to that. And it was Kierkegaard's idea that, that that makes our position absurd because we have to somehow hold together our need for eternal meaning with being temporal beings or the feeling like we express our actions freely while seeing ourselves as living in this, this, this world of causally uh, conditioned events or seeing everything and you know, our romantic relationships as just random contingent events of the people we happen to meet while at the same time feeling like we have to see our connection to this other person as if it was fated to be. We were meant to be together. Uh, we somehow, the human condition is so hard to get right because we have both of these aspects of ourselves that we see and it's difficult to get rid of either of them. We have to, we have to synthesize or unify them in some way. And Kierkegaard thought that's only possible by having a kind of unconditional commitment. That was his vision. Dostoevsky's is going to be quite different, and so this is not really just a repetition. Dostoevsky has a different vision of how we're going to reconcile these things and get to salvation, but it's going to be totally different than Kierkegaard's view. His, the, condition, the human state, though, this is something similar, and I call this the Karamazov condition because really we are meant to read this epic novel in, in universal terms. Uh, so the Karamazovs, they see themselves, they each have these contradictory natures, they are both earthly and heavenly. They, like Dimitri continually describes himself as, as an insect, while at the same time he has this angelic nature. They are both, they, they, they talk about their spirit or their heart, and, but at the same time they're humans with a, with a cognitive rationality and, and a head on their shoulders. They, they are both body and soul, and you can't be one without the other. How do you figure out how to, how to live with this condition? What we want to know is, what's Dostoevsky's solution going to be? How is he going to tell us to live authentically? Okay, Bef you're not going to get the answer yet. This, the story is 800 pages, remember. Uh, one other thing that I think connects Dostoevsky to Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard in his work, he talks about different forms of despair. Actually, his, his work, Sickness Unto Death, which we had a couple of quotes from, the sickness unto death is the state of despair in which we exist in. And we, we are just attempting to come to grips with that despair in different ways. So Kierkegaard actually has this worked out theory, which I think is really apt in its application to the Brothers Karamazov. This contradictory nature that we exist in means there's different forms of despair we could engage in. For one thing, we could sort of have no self. This would be like merely being animalistic. We wouldn't even be human if we didn't have this contradictory nature. After all, it is the human condition to have this contradictory self which we're trying to reconcile. So we might not even be fully human. Uh, we would just be an animal or something. This, to lack a self would be one version of despair. A different version would be to have a self, but to not even realize it. You don't even ex feel the anxiety, the difficulty of the human condition. Uh, so you just are in complete denial uh, of any sort of self. Um, this is just total self-denial, and that's a form of despair. Uh, you might be aware of yourself, so, so not only do you have a self, and you're not in denial of it, you're aware of it, but if you can't reconcile it, you can't reconcile these contradictory aspects of yourself, that would also be a, yet a third distinct form of despair. You could be failing to live the authentically, the, the best kind of life for a human. Um, so you would, you would have this contradictory self, but you would have no uh, kind of reconciliation. You can't even come up with uh, any reconciliation of it. Now, you might, uh, so a fourth form, the next attempt is, you might actually have a self, be aware of it, 
And you've actually, it's not that you have no reconciliation, you've got a reconciliation now, but it's totally unsuccessful. So you've attempted to come to a resolution of the human condition. You think you now can make sense of your life and live without despair, but it's not, it's not a working one. It, it fails. So you're still in despair, even though all your, through all your best efforts, you've even come up with some sort of reconciliation. It's, it's, not, it's not resolving life for you and helping you get to salvation. Of course, if you can do all those things and actually get to a successful reconciliation, then you'll be leading um, an authentic sort of life. Now, what I want you to do, let's take this sort of distinction or forms of despair and apply it to some of the Karamazov characters. What do you think Dimitri has? Where would you sort of try to locate Dimitri in this chart? So pause your videos and try to think about this. Where would Dimitri go? Okay, that was your last chance to pause the videos. What I think Dimitri is living is this state of no reconciliation. He clearly has this contradictory nature. It's not that he has no self. And he is also deeply aware of his self. He's deeply aware that he is an insect nature, and yet he wants to be a noble one. So, and I wouldn't even say he has an unsuccessful reconciliation yet. He just, he is acutely living both aspects, both his angelic and his, and his animalistic, his base aspects. He is insect and angel at the same time, and too keenly aware of it, and has no way of seeing through it and how the two could ever come together and be reconciled. And that is his, that is what makes his life so difficult. Um, and, and that's what, that's what connects him with his, the central theme of the film, his hatred, his, his uh, animosity toward his father and his debt to his father. Okay, now let's try, let's turn this analysis to Fyodor next. So pause your videos and see how you would try to make sense of the character of Fyodor now. Okay, that was your last chance to try to think it out. What I think, I think this is a harder one to make sense of, but in my view, Fyodor would go here. Um, he's not even aware of his self yet. I think it's wrong to say he has no self. So if Fyodor were too basely sensual, if he had no other aspects to himself, he was just the ravenous buffoon, then he would maybe go here as having no self at all. But I think in displaying his, him as a contradictory nature, I think Dostoevsky is giving us the sense that he's slightly more of a complicated character to that. Um, plus, I also um, you know, have a cheat. I have, I've read more of the book than I posted in the, in the readings for you. So let me just give you one more section, I think, that gets us to the sense that, Dos that Fyodor does have this other aspect to himself. He does have both parts of the human condition, but it's like, He's, he's in total denial of it. So he has no awareness. He has totally repressed his conflicted self. And he just sort of lives in this buffoonish way as a form of denial. So here's, a, here's from page 93. This is the original pagination of the, of the version uh, that we're using, where this is one of those moments where he, it, and it's described as these really unusual occasions when he engages in this kind of speculation and almost like, uh, fearful reverie. Um, so he says, uh, on these unusual occasions, it's a rather, rather subtle and complicated feelings. Fyodor would have been unable perhaps even to explain it. So he lacks self-knowledge, I think, as Dostoevsky is showing us. He doesn't really have self-knowledge because he is, he is suppressing this conflict in his nature um, through his buffoonish actions. But really, he does have a need for a cloth close and faithful man, you know, this is sort of describing like Grigory or another servant to, in this aristocratic worldview. Uh, but it's the sense in which he does have this need for human connection. This is his spiritual side, but it only barely peeks out every once in a while and otherwise remains deeply hidden. And even when it does, he sort of, in, it's inconceivable even to himself when he has these feelings from his spiritual side. Um, so, so the narrator says, these occasions were almost morbid, most depraved, and hidden his sensuality, often as a cruel as a wicked insect. Uh, he at times felt himself in his drunken moments a spiritual fear, a moral shock. So again, he's sort of getting on to the fact he's almost like Dimitri in these moments when he does have that sense of what is noble and what is ethical uh, and what is the spiritual or morally right thing. But again, but then it just gets quickly drowned out again um, and, and suppressed. 
Uh, notice again how he's, he's described as a wicked insect. This is the way Dimitri continually describes his, his base side um, as his insect nature. Okay, so this is my sense. Now I'm giving you sort of a deeper sense of what I think about these characters of Theodore and Dimitri. I think they're both in despair, but it's a very different types. So they really are living in different existential situations. And what we're going to see is how Dostoevsky gives us his picture of the successful human condition by seeing the various ways in which the humans try to reconcile and then either come to resolution or come to failure. So what we have to do is keep track of the fate of all of these characters, not just Fyodor and Dmitri, but of uh, Ivan and Alyosha and Smirjikov too. Okay, thanks.